The medical internship in Australia has been largely unchanged since the 1990s, but a massive change is about to take place. Find out why in this video. Over the next three years in Australia, there are massive changes to the medical training system, and I'll be covering them for you on this channel. One of these important changes will be to the Australian medical internship system, or more appropriately known as the pre-vocational training system. So in this video, I'm going to cover the reasons for the change. And then in the next video, we are gonna be interviewing a couple of the key stakeholders involved in these changes to find out about what these changes are and how the implementation process is progressing. So the pre-vocational training system in Australia covers the first two years after graduation from medical school. It's small in years, but still a significant part of the system. It's basically wedged between the medical school and the specialty training phases. And the internship has arguably been overlooked for quite some time. In fact, the last time there were any significant changes to the medical internship system in Australia was in the 1990s, when accreditation bodies were formed to oversee internships. And it was also at this time that the framework for the satisfactory completion of internship was set. Basically, you had to satisfactorily complete a 12 month provisional year experience, which included core rotations in medicine, surgery and emergency medicine. Since that time, our healthcare systems and needs have changed markedly, as has the broad approach to medical education and training. So stakeholders have come together and agreed that the current internship system is really not fit for purpose anymore. Some of the key reasons for this are a lack of consistent and adequate supervision, feedback and assessment, a lack of focus on skills development in critical areas such as communication, handover and patient safety, a lack of focus on the professional development and career choices of the interns, including problems with a lack of exposure to non-acute and community type experiences, inconsistent support for the well-being of interns, and the fact that in most states and territories, the system currently ignores a large group of doctors the resident or postgraduate year two doctors, which leaves them vulnerable and without adequate training support. The two years following medical school graduation are generally agreed to be the pre-vocational medical training period in Australia and New Zealand. This definition is somewhat arbitrary for a couple of reasons. Firstly, historically, the medical internship in Australia has been given a special status as a provisional year undertaken after graduation and you, before you are granted what's called general registration. According to Geffen, the internship was gradually introduced by state and territory medical registration boards between the 1930s and 1970s in Australia. And the intern period was initially intended to be a period of apprenticeship with little formal education structure when junior doctors progressed under supervision from knowing to doing. So it's for this reason that the Australian internship system is largely off limits to anyone other than a graduate from an Australian or New Zealand medical school. The second issue is that the immediate period after an internship in Australia has also evolved. Before the reforms to general practice training in the 1990s, a doctor could work as a general practitioner after gaining their general registration, so after completing their internship. But since the advent of vocational registration for general practice and its recognition as a specialty in its own right, we have seen the postgraduate year two, the PGY2 period, evolve into a largely hospital-based year, and sometimes it extends into a further PGY3 or PGY4 or PGY5 or even more period before doctors are able to enter into specialty training. So the pre-vocational medical councils have also had a varied stance on whether they support PGY2 doctors. They do in some states and territories and they don't in others. So this has led to a concern about a lost tribe of trainee doctors who are not protected or supported by an accreditation or training body. As I've said, the nature of the medical internship in Australia has remained largely the same since the 1990s when I completed my own medical internship. Beginning in 1982 with the Postgraduate Medical Education Council of Queensland, bodies were formed in the states and territories to accredit hospitals to be allocated interns to ensure that the interns were well supervised and that the care they were involved in was safe. By 2000, all states had some form of pre-vocational medical education council, with the two territories being serviced by other state councils. Around this time, the shape of the modern internship in Australia was formed. And to this very day, the internship experience and assessment process revolves primarily around the satisfactory completion of five rotations, about 10 to 11 weeks duration. And within these rotations, each intern is required to complete a term in a medical unit, a surgical unit, and in emergency. 
This internship experience has continued with few modifications. Some jurisdictions have trialed a four-term system and some pre-vocational councils have extended their accreditation approach through to the second year, as I said, and there's generally been a requirement to attend an educational program brought in as well. But the key requirements to complete an internship and be able to move on to general registration, i.e. completion of a satisfactory 12 months with core rotations in medicine, surgery and emergency, with those medical and surgical units now becoming highly specialised, have remained in place. In 2014, recognising the growing concern about the fitness for purpose of the Australian intern system, the Council of Australian Governments, that's basically all the state and territory and the federal government, commissioned a review of internship in Australia. And their final report in 2015, which you can see here, made a case for change. There were inconsistencies in the quality of training across different states and territories that led to disparities in the level of competency and preparedness of interns. So the report identified that there were high workloads and long working hours experienced by medical interns with limited opportunities for professional development and a lack of focus on things like essential communication and patient safety and handover skills, which are needed to ensure safe and effective care of patients. Even worse, in my opinion, the report also noted that interns were rarely missing out on exposure to general practice and other community settings. General practice and primary care is a critical area of need in Australia. Given the ageing population and the high prevalence of chronic diseases, the current intern system is really failing to focus on chronic disease management and community-based care, which is where the bulk of healthcare actually occurs in Australia. This graph shows that the training of general practitioners has kept pace with the population over the last few years. But in the same time, the number of non-GP specialists has increased more markedly. Projecting out to 2032, there is going to be a major gap in the ratio of GPs to our population. And when one factors in the needs of an aging population, as well as an aging workforce, this graph from a Deloitte's Access Economic Report suggests that the demand for GP services is going to hugely outstrip the available supply. Weirdly and interestingly, mainly in our major metropolitan centres. This, of course, will place additional pressure on the other components of the healthcare system, particularly the hospitals. Now, the internship period is the time when most trainee doctors select a specialty to focus their careers on. So by focusing the internship experience on acute and specialised medical and surgical care, interns are not being adequately exposed to a number of other specialties where there is a need for more trainee doctors, particularly specialties like general practice, general medicine and psychiatry, my own specialty. The intern review report also highlighted the lack of adequate supervision and feedback in the current internship program, and that the current assessment process lacked standardisation. Indeed, when I was the medical director of the Health Education and Training Institute between 2012 and 2016, we were aware that the current supervisor rating reports for interns provided very little discrimination in rating interns' performance. And basically, they were not identifying interns that were underperforming. So the final intern report has recommended that the assessment process should be redesigned to focus more on the development of skills and competencies rather than completing experiences. Skills like communicating effectively in a clinical setting rather ju than just acquiring knowledge and getting weeks and months up. The report suggests adopting a competency-based approach to assessment which would involve defining the key skills and competencies that medical interns should possess upon completing the internship program and then assessing their progress towards these goals throughout the program. This would in theory ensure that interns and residents receive the necessary support and feedback that they need to develop their key skills and competencies in order to provide high quality care to their patients. The final report also briefly discussed the postgraduate year two. PGY2 training and did indeed highlight concerns regarding the current system. Specifically, the report noted that there was a lack of consistency in the structure and content of PGY2 training across different states and territories again. The report basically recommended that the PGY2 training program should be standardised across the country and that there should be a focus on ensuring that those doctors also receive appropriate supervision, feedback and opportunities for professional development during this period. So suppose you're watching this video now and you're a medical student, thank you if you are, and you're watching this video, I'm guessing in this case you're probably thinking that the current internship system in Australia is pretty archaic 
and not at all like how you're currently being taught and assessed as a medical student. And indeed, much has changed in other countries in this time. Internship programs in the United Kingdom, New Zealand and Canada are examples of programs that have successfully transitioned and addressed some of the challenges faced by the Australian system. So it's not like we're going to be starting from scratch. For example, the United Kingdom has implemented a foundation program a two-year training program for medical graduates that includes rotations through various clinical specialties, as well as a focus on developing generic skills such as the communication, teamwork and leadership skills. Canada has been even more radical in this time by dispensing with the internship altogether. Finally, New Zealand has implemented a competency-based internship program that focuses on the development of specific skills and competencies rather than just the acquisition of knowledge. So the argument here is that Australia can learn from these international examples and a more innovative and flexible approach to medical intern training. Even closer to home within Australia, reforms to medical schools and specialty training have already occurred, basically along the same lines. So the new internship system should, in theory, look familiar to those medical graduates coming through. In my opinion, it would be foolish to hold onto a system designed in the 1990s that was designed for a much different world than today, especially when so many stakeholders have advocated that the system is really not any longer fit for purpose. Look, much has changed both in healthcare and health and wellbeing and the needs of our nation in that time. There have also been many changes to education and technology at the same time. Bringing resident PGY2 doctors under an accreditation system will go a long way to ensuring that fewer trainee doctors are left exposed to the whim of hospitals providing service jobs and working on safe rosters. Now there will still be other unaccredited trainees and senior residents remaining who also require a body or something to protect their needs and interests, but this step is a much needed reform. A change to the philosophy, the pedagogy, of internship training and assessment has the potential to bring improvements to patient safety, the satisfaction and well-being of interns, and intern preparedness. A positive for the suggested change in the model is that most other components of the Australian medical training system have adopted similar competency-based medical training and assessment processes. So the approach and tools will hopefully be familiar to most in the system. I really do agree that we need to better align the career aspirations of medical graduates with the population needs and move away from expensive models of patch up acute care to community-based preventative and primary care. Exposure to non-traditional intern rotations, including working in chronic care and community care, will hopefully help to sway the minds of some. But it'll also be naive to not recognise that the intern or pre-vocational training system is only one small piece in a much larger medical training system, many components of which have a big investment in maintaining the status quo model of hospital-focused healthcare delivery. The devil will, as per usual, lie in both the detail of the proposed changes as well as their implementation. And so in our next video, we'll have a look at some of those proposed changes and where they are up to in terms of the implementation phase. If you like this video, please subscribe and turn on notifications. And I look forward to joining you in another video. Bye for now.